So this lecture is part of an online course in the theory of numbers and will be about Fermat's theorem. So Fermat's theorem is the one that says a to the p is congruent to a mod p if p is prime. And it's possibly one of the single most useful theorems in number theory. So it was originally proved by Fermat, but many of Fermat's proofs have just been lost. And the following proof um, was given by Euler. So Euler spent um, quite a lot of his life reconstructing Fermat's work. Um, it's quite likely that Euler's proof may have been the same as Fermat's proof. It's, it's a fairly obvious way of proving it. So what we do is we prove it by induction on A. And it's obvious for A equals zero, and we're going to prove it for positive A, and the proof for negative A is, is pretty much the same. So what we want to do is to show that the result for A, so we want to show that A to the P is congruent to A mod P, implies A plus one to the P is congruent to A plus one mod P. So, so this is what we have to prove. And to do this, what we do is we just expand a plus 1 to the p by the binomial theorem. So this is a to the p plus p choose 1, a to the p minus 1 plus p choose 2, a to the p minus 2, and so on, all the way down to p choose p minus 1, a plus 1. And now we sort of stare at this and we notice we've got this term a to the p, which by our inductive hypothesis is congruent to a. And here we've got a 1, which is congruent to 1. So let's look at this a and this 1. And these give us a plus 1, which is, which is what we want here. On the other hand, <coughs> we've got all this junk in the middle. Um, so what do we do with this? Well, it's all divisible by p. And the reason being that all these binomial coefficients are divisible by p. So p choose i is equal to p factorial over p minus i factorial times i factorial. And we notice that this is divisible by p. But the denominator is not divisible by p. At least if 1 is less than or equal to i is less than or equal to p minus 1. So if i is 0, this bit's divisible by p, and if i is p, this bit's divisible by p. But anything else, neither of these bits have a factor of p. And here we're using the fact that p is prime, of course. Um, so, um, so this shows that a plus 1 to the p is congruent to a plus 1 modulo p. So the result is true for all a by induction. <clears throat> There's an alternative version of Fermat's last, not, not his last theorem, of Fermat's theorem. So one version says that a to the p is congruent to a mod p, and the other version says that a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p, uh, provided a and p are co-prime. Um, now, the fact that this ver second version implies the first version is obvious. We just multiply it by a. And you might think you can go from the first version to the second version by dividing by a, and you sort of can, but you've got to be rather careful when dividing in congruences. You remember we saw this example um, earlier, that 2 times 2 is congruent to 2 times 0 mod 4, but 2 is not equivalent to 0 mod 4. So we can't you can't divide this congruence by 2. It gives a wrong answer. So, so when can we divide um, a congruence? So suppose that AB is congruent to AC modulo M. Then B is congruent to C mod M if a and m are co-prime. So we need this extra condition to divide by numbers in a congruence. And this follows fairly easily because if a and m are co-prime, then ax plus my equals 1 for some x 
y. And this says that ax is congruent to 1 modulo m. So in other words, x is an inverse of a mod m. And now to go from this uh, to this equation here, all we have to do is um, we get x a b is congruent to x a c mod m by multiplying by x. And then we get b is congruent to c mod m because x times a is equal to 1. So we can sometimes divide by numbers and congruences. And now, if you notice up here, we assume that a and p were co-prime, in which case we can divide by, by a and get the second version of Fermat's theorem. Um, incidentally, um, um, you, you can ask, is there a generalization of Fermat's theorem to cases when p isn't prime? Um, and it's the second version that generalizes nicely to p not being prime. This was done by Euler and will be Euler's theorem that we will discuss in a later lecture. Um, now we're going to have some applications of Fermat's theorem, but um, in, or in order to apply it, we, we need the concept of the order of A modulo M. So the order of A modulo M is the smallest integer e greater than zero with a to the power of e is congruent to 1 mod m. That's if e exists. There might not be any such integer e. For instance, if a is zero, then no power of um, a with e greater than 1 is going to be 1. Um, and now we notice that a to the n is congruent to 1 modulo m if and only if n is divisible by e. So this is a very useful fact. And this is kind of obvious. First of all, if, if n is equal to e um, c, then a to the n equals e to the e c, a to the e c, which is equal to a to the e to the c, which is equal to 1 to the c, which is equal to 1. On the other hand, if a to the um, n is congruent to 1, then we can divide by e with the remainder. So we can put n is equal to q times e plus a remainder r with naught less than or equal to r is less than e. And then we see since a to the n equals 1 and a to the e equals 1. This implies a to the r equals 1. And since r is less than e, and e was chosen to be the uh, smallest integer with this property, this implies r equals 0. So e divides n. Um, in particular, we've got a useful corollary from Fermat's last theorem. So, so we have a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p for p a equals 1. So the order of a divides p minus 1 because we said that the order of a divides n if whenever a to the n equals 1. So this is a very useful fact about um, integers co-prime to p. And we're now going to use that. So let's have our first application. So earlier on, um, we proved that there were infinitely many primes of the form 1 plus 4n by showing by using the following fact. If p divides n squared plus 1, then p equals 2 or p is congruent to 1 modulo 4. And you can just check this quickly if we take n to be, say, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and we look at the primes dividing n squared plus 1, the primes, well, 1 squared plus 1 is, is just 2, and then we get 5, and here 2 and 5 divide 10, here we get 17, here we get 2 and 13, here we get 37, 2 and 5, and here we get 5 and 13, and so on. You can see that these are all either 2 or they're 1 mod 4. It's actually not too difficult to check that every prime of the form 1 mod 4 divides n squared plus 1 for some n. Um, anyway, let, let's prove this. So suppose p divides n squared plus 1. Let's assume p is odd. 
because the case p equals 2 is completely trivial. Then this says that n squared is congruent to minus 1 modulo p. That's just another way of saying p divides n squared plus 1. Then we see that n to the 4 is congruent to 1 mod p. And from this we see that the order of n divides 4. So it must be 1, 2 or 4. But from this equation here we see that the order is not equal to 1 or 2. So the order of n is 4. We should say it's order mod p just because it can have different orders for other numbers. And now we just apply the observation we had earlier that the order of a with a p equals 1 um, divides p minus 1. So the order of n which is equal to 4 divides p minus 1, so p is congruent to 1 modulo 4. Um, by the way, we use the fact that p is equal to is odd because we want to know that minus 1 is not equal to 1 because p is, p is not equal to 2. If it was equal to 2, then, then the order of um, n is going to be less than 4. Um, um, now we're going to have some applications to showing that some numbers are or aren't primes. And for this we need the following useful lemma. Suppose p divides a to the q minus 1 but not a minus 1. Here we're going to take p and q to be primes. Um, then p is congruent to 1 modulo q. And this is very useful for um, finding primes dividing numbers of the form a to the q minus 1 as, as we will see in a bit. Um, well this is very easy to show using the ideas about orders we have, we know that a to the q is congruent to 1 modulo p. So the order of a divides q. On the other hand, the order is not equal to 1 uh, because we basically said so up here. And q is prime. And since q is prime, um, the order of a must be 1 or q. And if the order isn't 1, it must be q. Which is what we were trying to show. Uh, so, oh sorry, I haven't quite finished. So since the order of a equals q, this implies q divides p minus 1, which is what we are trying to show. That's just the same as saying p is 1 mod q. And that's because the order of any element has to divide p minus 1. OK, now we can start finding some primes. So here's the first example. Let's show 2 to the 13 minus 1, which is 8191, is prime. Well, you all know how to find prime, how to, how to check whether a number is prime. We can test all primes less than or equal to root n to see if they divide n. So this is the basic test to test whether numbers are prime. Well, the it works, but trouble is it's rather a lot of work. I mean, we would have to test um, all primes less than the square root of this, so it should be all primes up to about 90, and 
you know, we could do it, but using Fermat's theorem, we can greatly speed this up. So um, if P divides 2 to the 13 minus 1 and P does not divide 2 minus 1, well, this condition is kind of completely vacuous because no primes divide 2 minus 1, then 13 divides p minus 1. So this is what we proved from the last sheet, that 2 has order 13 mod p, so 13 must divide p minus 1. And now we just need to check um, primes of the form 13n plus 1. And there aren't so many of these. Um, n must be even, so we get 2 times 13 plus 1, which is 27. Well, that's no good. Then we get 52 plus 1, which is 53. And then we get 6 times 13, which is 78, plus 1, which is 79. And then the next one is bigger than the square root of 8191. So um, the others are bigger than the square root of 8191. So we just check that 53 and 79 do not divide 8191. This is an easy piece of long division. And as you can see, this is speeded up testing whether this is prime by a factor of about 10, because instead of having to check um, more than 20 primes, we just need to check two. Um, uh, now, um, I want to discuss Fermat primes. So one of the things early number theorists did uh, was, was they looked at for primes of the form 2 to the n minus 1 or 2 to the n plus 1. And the ones of the form 2 to the n minus 1 are called the Mersenne primes, and these ones are called Fermat primes. So let's, let's try and um, study Fermat primes. So, so we can ask, when is 2 to the n plus 1 a prime? Well, first of all, if n is odd, and greater than 1, then it's not prime. Um, the reason is that if um, um, that, that if m is odd, then um, um, x to the m plus 1 is divisible by um, x plus 1 because it's equal to x plus 1 times x to the m minus 1 minus x to the m minus 2 plus x to the m minus 3 all the way down to plus 1. And if m was even, we'd, th 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 this wouldn't quite work out. So first of all, we, we observe n must be odd. Well, we can do better than that. In fact, n cannot be divisible by any odd number greater than 1, because if n was equal to a b with b odd, then we could write 2 to the n plus 1 equals 2 to the a to the b plus 1, and this is divisible by 2 to the a plus 1. So um, we find n is a power of 2. So Fermat investigated these numbers where n is a power of 2. Um, well, that, that, that's apart from the case n equals 0, which doesn't really count. Um, here we're going to take n greater than 0, just to avoid the silly case when n is 0. So we look at the first few cases. So 2 to the 2 to the 0 plus 1 is 3, 2 to the 2 to the 1 plus 1 is 5, 2 to the 2 to the 2 plus 1 is um, 17, 2 to the 3 plus 1 is 257, um, um, 2 to the 2 to the 4 plus 1 is 65537. And these are the so called Fermat primes. And Fermat checked their prime, and let's check 
that 65537 is prime. And we're going to do it in the way that Fermat probably did it. I mean, these days you can just, I mean, you can just type 65537 into Wikipedia and Wikipedia has an entire page about this number telling you it's prime. So that's very quick. Anyway, um, if you don't have something like that, what you can do is as follows. So suppose P divides 65537 and let's take P less than or equal to the square root of 65537. Three, seven. We want to show that there's no prime satisfying these conditions. Well, this means p divides 2 to the 16 plus 1. So 2 to the 16 is congruent to minus 1 mod p. And now we can, we can square it and we get 2 to the 32 is congruent to 1 mod p. And now we can look at what is the order of 2. Well, it divides... 32. And it divides 32 because of this condition here. Um, it does not divide 16, does not divide 16, and it does not divide 16 because of this condition here. See, 2 to the 16 is minus 1, so 2 to the anything dividing 16 can't possibly be 1. And since the only factors of 32 are either divide 16 or 32, so the order of 2 is exactly um, 32. So we can now apply um, this. So, so 2 has order 32 mod p. So p is congruent to 1 mod 32. And we also want p is less than um, or equal to the square root of 65537. And now what Fermat presumably did is he wrote down the possible primes p. Well, let's first of all write down all numbers that are 1 mod 30. Um, So, the, so, sorry, that are 1 mod 32, uh, we get 33, 65, 97, 129, 161, 193, 225, and then, then the next one would be 257, which is, the, we can, now we can cross them out as follows. This is too large. So we don't need to bother checking it. It's bigger than the square root of that. Um, there are some others we can cross out because they're divisible by 3. So that's divisible by 3, that's divisible by 3, and that's divisible by 3. And there are some others we can cross out because they're divisible by 5. So 65 is divisible by 5, that's divisible by 5, but whatever. Um, and if you're quite good at mental arithmetic, you might have noticed that this one is divisible by 7. So this leaves exactly two numbers to check. So we just have to check that 65537 is not divisible by 97 or 193. And at this point you have to stop and do some long division, which I'm not going to do because it's the only thing more tedious than doing long division is watching somebody else do it. So anyway, this has reduced the problem of checking, you know, about 40 or 50 primes less than 257 to just taking two primes, which is a couple of minutes work if you're good at long division. So this is probably how Fermat proved that 65537 is a prime number. Um, well, what about the next number? So we have 2 to the 32 plus 1, and as I'm lazier than Fermat, I'm not going to write it out explicitly. Well, Euler found a factor of 641. 
And how did he find this? I mean, Euler was good at hand calculating, but even for Euler testing all primes up to 641 must be a, would have been a bit of a pain. Well, well of course he didn't. Um, he used a very similar argument to what we did. So we know that if p divides 2 to the 32 plus 1, then this says 2 to the 32 plus is congruent to minus 1 mod p. 2 to the 64 is congruent to 1 mod p. So um, as before, order of 2 is 64. So p is congruent to 1 modulo 64. And what Euler presumably did was he wrote down the possible numbers. You get 65, 129, 193, 257, 321, 385, 449, 513, 577, 641, 705, 769. I don't know how far Euler went, but um, he presumably did this. And then you cross off the ones that are obviously not primed. So that's divisible by 5. That's divisible by 3. This one's divisible by 3. This one's divisible by 5. Um, um, that one's divisible by 3. That one's divisible by 5. Um, well, that does leave a few to check. Um, so, And what Euler probably did is he checked 2 to the 32 plus 1 for divisibility by these numbers, and at 641 he got lucky and found a factor. Um, there's actually a rather minor historical puzzle about this, which is how come Fermat himself didn't find this factor? Um, so Fer we know Fermat was quite happy doing large amounts of numerical calculation. I mean, he would have had no problem working out 2 to 32 plus 1. In fact, he worked out 2 to the 64 plus 1 explicitly, which is much bigger. And he had no problem doing long division. And testing these five numbers would have taken him a few minutes. And he certainly knew an argument very similar to this one. So why didn't he do that? I mean, he claimed that he thought that all numbers of the form 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1 are prime. Um, well, no one's quite sure. Um, the most likely guess is that Fermat did check 641 to see whether it was a factor in this and just made a numerical error in his calculation. But we don't know for sure. Um, OK, so next lecture we'll be showing how to use Fermat's last theorem to check some other much larger numbers to see whether they're primes.